Dialogue at the Wilson Center is a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And now here's your host, John Molusky. Hello and welcome to the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. This week, we convene our Environment Roundtable for a discussion of possible unintended consequences resulting from efforts to respond to climate change. Our guests are Jeff DeBelko, Senior Advisor to the Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program and Director of Environmental Studies at Ohio University. Lisa Friedman, Deputy Editor of Climate Wire and Stacey Vandeveer, Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of New Hampshire. I want to welcome all of you to Dialogue, and Thanks. Jeff, welcome back from Ohio, back you, to D.C., your old hunts. Uh -huh. Now, let me ask you about this concept of backdraft I have in front of me. This is a, a document you handed out, an event that the three of you just participated in here at the mm -hmm. center. Mm -hmm. And if you would explain this concept of backdraft, what sure. we're talking Absolutely, about. Absolutely, John. Thank you so much. So we have, for probably the last eight years, maybe, focused on what the impacts of climate change may mean in a security realm or in a conflict realm. So will the rising tides, will the changing temperatures, will um, the impacts of climate change have uh, meaning and, and threats in a security context? Will it contribute to violence? Really important topics, really unclear exactly what will happen in part because climate change impacts are still unfolding. Um, and ones that a, a lot of important people in the climate world, in the development world, and in the security world are paying attention to. What this report tries to do is say, there's a whole nother set of issues that we haven't really wrapped our, 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 our arms around and, and thought about in a, a systematic manner, but we really need to. And that is, as we respond to climate change, we need to go in with our eyes open because there are ways that we can do that well and there are ways that we can do that poorly. And particularly if we do it poorly and don't take account of the potential for how those changes in access to resources or the different um, renewable energy schemes that we do, if we do that in a way that doesn't take account of the potential for creating conflict or playing into existing lines of tension, um, then we have the problem of potentially creating that conflict, but also undercutting the efforts, the important efforts, the critical efforts to uh, address climate change and make a transition to a, a, a greener economy. And, and the counterintuitive aspect to this is that the things that we think might be uh, beneficial or improving the situations could actually end up creating problems. Well, I, I think change means that there are winners and losers. And so we can't pretend that there aren't going to be real challenges that come with change. And we really do need to change our energy systems, our way of life, and, and that's going to be disruptive. But we can do that, and we have lessons that we've learned from, from analogous situations and even our initial efforts to, that we can do it, we can take account of these issues if we are willing to break out of our silos, understand that climate change is not a single sector intervention uh, impact or a response, and understand that it needs to be taken into account in this wider context. Lisa, uh, looking at reporting on climate change generally, does it reflect these nuances? I think it's a challenge. Um, you know, on the one hand, you have, uh, you know, not as many resources in, in journalism generally sure. um, as there used to be, and specifically in the field of environment. I mean, you just have fewer people covering environmental issues than, than you once did. Um, you know, Climate Wire, I think, is really unique, and we've been, been lucky enough and able to go um, to sort of do boots on the ground reporting about what climate change means for vulnerable countries and vulnerable communities in those places, like Bangladesh, um, like Nepal, Nepal like, like Pakistan. Um, I think that there are easy stories to tell and hard stories to tell. The hard stories, to me, are the ones that are the most interesting. And one of those hard stories is sort of exactly the thing that, that Jeff and, and, and you'll hear from Stacy in a moment are pointing out. What, um, what are the institutional needs that countries have as they try to, to grapple with these issues when you're, when you're dealing with a country like, um, you know, like Bangladesh, like Pakistan, that have immediate needs, that have immediate health, education um, needs? How, how will they grow and develop to help their countries respond to some of the dire environmental challenges that they face? Um, and what do we as journalists have to look for sort of around the corner? You know, Jeff is, is in this report to me looking around the corner. What's, 
what's next and what's on the horizon. And it's uh, sort of the story of unintended consequences. Exactly. And how much of when you go in to report on a story, how much of the story emerges organically in that way where you think you're reporting about something and then you tr stumble upon these unintended consequences? Absolutely. And, and you know, maybe this isn't um, specifically an, uh, an issue of unintended consequences, but un unintended stories. Um, you know, one of the things that I found when I was reporting in, in Bangladesh was that um, while on the one hand there was a lot of attention from the um, from activists from the environmental community about um, the concerns about conflict spilling over between countries, what communities were really worried about internally was um, what what it meant for conflict internally. What happens when people from coastal communities in Bangladesh move to cities like Dhaka? Um, population levels start exploding, slums are exploding, infrastructure, civic infrastructure, mm -hmm. all of it is faulty um, or non-existent, um, and what are some of the problems that, that spill over from that? Uh, Stacey, well, it's, I know it's hard to slice and dice this in any kind of specific manner, but I'm wondering when this concept of backdraft and these unintended consequences or creating new problems mm -hmm. uh, while trying to fix old problems, how, how much of this is about exacerbating ex situations that are already uh, present on the ground or versus creating brand new circumstances? Yeah, there's certainly some of both. Um, so m my work in the report is on uh, the human uh, humanitarian labor and environmental problems around mining and around sort of large scale mining all, all over the world. And so when we look at the technologies that we need more of to address the climate crisis, from renewable energies, you know, from the wind turbines to the lithium batteries in cars to a whole, um, a whole set of communications technologies. Um, those, it turns out, m uh, make very si significant demands on mining and mining communities. So some of it is exacerbating the problems in mining, in the mining industry, in the sector, and in parts of the world that are very dependent on exporting commodities. But some of it also engenders new ones. So that when, um, so let's have an example. Um, uh, technology, uh, technological products change really quickly. So if I am a major company and I redesign um, uh, a very trendy phone, for example, or I redesign uh, um, uh, how we might make uh, the the, uh, the mechanisms in a wind turbine, it turns out that I. I can retool my production facility, and I can and I make um, much very significant demands on a on a very rare metal. So it's uh, I can create a kind of boom, a kind of rush in in various parts of the world for people who are who are literally desperate to provide me with this new commodity because there is real cash on the table right now when um, when those products demand uh, these commodities way back up the chain. So you can make existing problems much worse, but you can also encourage people to simply drop what they're doing and rush into to mine coltan or, or, some, other, uh, or some other substance in order to meet this new demand and, and pretty rapidly uh, engender uh, uh, environmental and human and community challenges in places that the people making product decisions don't have any idea about. So y yesterday's oil is tomorrow's lithium or yeah, something exactly. of that nature. The, you know, Jeff, this raises a question about uh, and I'm sure you've heard this criticism and the pushback from environmentalists who might say, this just becomes a prescription to not do anything. Yeah. And, I, and we are certainly aware of that potential interpretation of putting out a report that talks about the potential of, of conflict from responding to climate. But uh, I think we, we thought that there's an even greater danger that comes from responding and doing it in a fashion that is um, poorly considered and then undercuts both the wider strategic case for responding to climate and then also may discredit specific and promising mechanisms to respond. So for example, it's a terrible challenge to find ways to put a value on a forest standing, mm -hmm. uh, performing a, a critical climate role as a carbon sink mm -hmm. uh, versus the value of that as timber. And so that is really it's easy to figure out how much the, those trees are worth versus keeping it standing uh, much harder uh, to do. And so the notion that we would find ways to pay for those ecosystem services, the services that the trees have in terms of storing carbon, tremendously important and promising. But it means that we're going to change access to those forests for the people living in them. And we're going to hopefully provide resources to make up for and to reflect that value. Now, that if you're changing access and you're introducing money into the system, that can be done well or that can be done poorly. 
So we need to take steps to make sure those, mm -hmm. those particular schemes are done in a way that doesn't discredit the whole enterprise unintentionally because we haven't taken into consideration, haven't gone in with our eyes open to the prospects for, for conflict. And, and I want to uh, dig a little into what those steps might be because what you're suggesting, you're, you're, the paradigm you've created here is we have uh, the desire for investment and economic growth on one side and then without destroying the ecosystem or, or mm -hmm. leasing it away or giving it away. So how is this managed? Is there, is there an international governance? Is it country by country? Is it locale by locale? I mean, we can all agree to the big picture uh, uh, standard that you just suggested that we need to do this in a careful and thoughtful mm -hmm. manner. Mm -hmm. But what are the mechanisms to ensure mm -hmm. that that happens? And we can all put our heads together on well, this answer because I, I know I, it's a big question. The, the, uh, there are no doubt many pathways, right? So that so f on the one hand, on the corporate side, you've got ongoing discussions about corporate social responsibility, about standards for financial transparency. All of these things um, would be intended or are intended uh, to help give people in mining communities or in other kinds of producer communities access to information about how much money is moving back and forth between a big international corporation and their own government and how it is being used. And if they were promised a healthcare clinic when they opened the mine, did they get a healthcare clinic when they opened the mine? So I mean, so some of them that are, that are not necessarily environmental solutions uh, like financial transparency or corporate transparency, those have to do with fundamental access of people. And people want to live in a healthy place and they want economic opportunity. So in, 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 you, can, you can use those different avenues. And then we've got s some regulatory options. Um, uh, um, making it mandatory, uh, another option, making it mandatory that, that firms report where things come from and under what conditions they're mined or produced or made. This challenge connects as much to climate change as it does to garment factories and other things that have been in the news lately. Uh, Le I'm sorry, go, go ahead, Lisa. Well, I mean, I mean, just on the international governance and, um, you know, th through the UN system, there are um, a lot of funds that, that deal with this. The, the sort of burgeoning developing one is called the Green Climate Fund. It is something that is growing out of the UN negotiations on climate change. Um, the, it, is, it is in the process of, of getting uh, its architecture built up and developing. It's still largely an empty shell, though the the hope of many is that it will be something on the order of a hundred billion dollar a year fund. Um, some of the questions that you know that have not yet been been answered are some of the things that I think both of you are looking at, which is which range from how do you how do you gauge how vulnerable a country is who's most vulnerable is there going to be a list of you know um you know is is vietnam more vulnerable than you know than the philippines um uh i think that they're going to have to answer questions about how ready and able governments and institutions are to handle some of the adaptation needs of their countries and and if not the governments themselves, who should be getting that money, who's best to tackle some of the, the tough issues that, that both of you are, are working on. Is someone thinking ahead on this, or is this more in reaction to people who are exploiting situations with land grabs or other things of that nature? Well, I, I think this is one of the objectives of, of having this set of, of articles, to raise the, um, to raise the issue so that there are certainly in all these institutions people who are looking at these and taking them seriously, but there's still a very strong temptation to um, see a climate issue uh, and climate impacts and climate response within a, within a stovepipe, within a silo. Mm -hmm. And so there are appropriate climate responses and there are ones that are just outside that realm. And so this in part is a, is a, a, a plea for us to do what is very difficult to do, but to work across our silos, work across our bureaucracies, and understand that it is, it is not a single sector mm -hmm. issue or response. And that we, if we walk into a room and we know everyone in it, we're not doing our job because we're not getting out enough to understand that in the conflict realm, there are a whole bunch of actors who aren't climate actors per se, but they need to be part of the discussion. It's the development community, the humanitarian community, the finance community, the private sector, that it really does require conversations that we're not good at having, that we don't have lots of natural places to have. So your institutional question, that, that it, it becomes 
uh, even just different languages. And so being able to have that fluency across those areas is critical to avoiding some of these unintended consequences. The, the time we have remaining for this discussion is alarmingly brief given <laughs> how much there is still to talk about. So I'm going to try something. Once I'm going to do a very quick lightning round where I'm going to just ask each of you for a one or two or three word response about mm -hmm. when you think about the problem we've been discussing. Uh, what's your reaction to where is a hot spot that needs almost immediate attention? Some area of the globe or some circumstance that where, where this problem is unattended and needs to be addressed. Stacy, we'll, we'll throw the hot potato to you first. Uh, my response is that we have to think about how to better govern the global economy. It's true in climate change, garment factories, all kinds of things. So not one specific thing, but just that general is the, the big problem to be fixed. India, Pakistan, water management issues between these two countries I think has the potential for um, both incredible opportunities or on the other hand, explosive mm. um, difficulties. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's paired geographies that big policy decisions in Europe have tremendous impacts on the other side of the earth. So if you're growing your energy with a renewable target in Europe, that has real implications for the force of Indonesia and mm -hmm. Malaysia. Okay, and now since you all did so well at managing 10 <laughs> seconds, now I'm, I've generously saved about 30 for each of you before we close. And this is, what I want to ask you is because, again, this is a big topic, and uh, often in these situations, too much onus put on the uninformed moderator compared to the informed guests to decide what we talk about, is what is the thing we haven't talked about yet that's very important to this discussion that people should be thinking about before they, they leave and, and do some research on their own? And again, about 30 seconds left for each of you, Stacy. Yeah, I, th I think the thing to think about is that we, that we cannot just uh, overlay new, greener, more efficient technologies on the problem of the, of the global economy that we already have. So that if we know that huge environmental damage is being driven or, or, or um, uh, exploitation of humans in all kinds of places on the earth is, is happening because of the structure of the global economy, we can't pretend that just having greener technologies um, you know, around us will fix those problems. We have to think about the structural problems. You've written some good stuff on this about how the, the old economy, the new economy can look a lot like the old economy in terms of outcomes if we don't think it through. Yeah. Um, you know, as a journalist, I guess I'd say that, that I really look for not so much what's not being talked about, but where are the great stories, right, that aren't yeah. being told yet. And, and um, you know, as someone who covers the UN climate talks ad nauseum, I would say that that is not where the great stories are right now. <laughs> um, even though there is, you know, a new agreement on the horizon that, that many are hoping will get nailed down in 2015, which could be significant. But to me, as I cover these things, the real stories, the great stories, are things that are happening on the ground in countries. Um, you know, whether it's the, the now, you know, well-told story of, of China's renewable energy development, but also, um, you know, fascinating things happening in, in incredibly poor countries like Ethiopia um, that, are, that are working to green their economy. Countries like Guatemala that are taking adaptation very seriously. I mean, I can point to countries all over the globe that are doing really serious things on the ground, both on mitigation and adaptation. And, and for me, that's where, that's where I think the great yeah. stories are right now. There's an old adage about if you focus too much on the headlines, you miss the trend lines. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, I think I would say uh, this notion of geoengineering is one that we've included but not discussed here, which is because of our lack of progress with the institutions that we've, we've talked about, it, it almost a notion of a, a, a free pass. And instead of reducing our use of carbon in the energy economy, it is to make dramatic interventions in the atmosphere or the oceans to reflect more sunlight back out or to store carbon in ways that really um, little to no understanding of what that means from a technological perspective, little to no international norms, let alone laws for governing that, and really poses a challenge when one country decides to do it and those interventions may have impa dramatic impacts mm -hmm. for all parts of the world. And we just haven't even begun to think about how it works and how, and how we govern it. On that cautionary note, I want to thank uh, the three of you for joining us today. A terrific conversation. Thank really you. Enjoyed thank it. You. Learned a lot. Uh, when we return, Alan, a Aaron Miller returns to the program to discuss Syria's use of chemical weapons and the notion of crossing lines right after this. The Wilson Center is America's living memorial to its 28th president, connecting the world of policymaking to practical options derived from the world's finest ideas, research, analysis, and honest nonpartisan conversation. Visit us on the web at wilsoncenter.org. And now we return to more dialogue at the Wilson Center. Welcome back. 
Pressure to intervene in the conflict in Syria increased recently when it was reported that the regime used chemical weapons against rebel forces. President Obama and others suggested that Syria had crossed the line that could change the nature of the international response. Here to discuss the latest from Syria and the Middle East is the Wilson Center's Vice President for New Initiatives and a distinguished scholar with the Middle East program, Aaron David Miller. Aaron, welcome back to Dialogue. Great to have you as Pleasure always. Pleasure to be here, John. The piece you wrote in Salon.com under the title, Syria, What's Really Happening? It leads to the question, do we know what's really happening? Yeah, not my title. Uh, I, I don't choose these Editors, things. But, uh, you know, but things I, I think against the general backdrop of fog of war, a regime determined to control access, a vicious conflict that has to some degree kept the media at arm's length. We know actually quite a bit. Um, on the issue of chemicals, I think it's, it's clear and many intelligence agencies have more or less validated this, that some chemical agents have been used uh, at least twice by the regime and accusations, of course, that the opposition has used them uh, as well. But, but uh, given our experience in Iraq and Afghanistan, it's critically important and the administration was right about this piece of the red line exercise that they seek international validation through the UN to in ensure that if military action were to become the outcome of this red line cross that we had the support of the international community for intelligence that was credible and validated. So uh, I, 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 I think it's a pretty safe bet that um, these agents, probably Sarin, uh, w were deployed by the regime. When you say if we, uh, given our experience in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, w do you think if that had not happened in an alternate universe, we would be engaged in Syria now? I don't, because I think the president, the great extricator in chief, determined to get America out of um, gratuitously harmful wars and avoid new ones, is determined, uh, willfully determined, to try to do everything he possibly can to avoid the slippery slope of an incremental military intervention. So I think under under almost any circumstance I could imagine, he'll, um, he'll be extremely risk, risk averse. Is there any uh, great momentum or great call other than some of the political rhetoric we've heard from people, say like Senator McCain, is there any great momentum or support for direct military intervention uh, within the U.S.? None as far as I can see. I mean, the, the polls continue to show a disinterest or, and certainly opposition to, or let's put it this way, no, no majority support for uh, uh, American intervention if it involves additional expense and deployment of American men and women on the ground. And none of that is because people are uh, uh, complacent about what's going on. Everybody thinks this is a crisis of, of significant import, and yet we are going to sit it out. Well, everybody in the chattering classes thinks it's that. I mean, most Americans, uh, probably, rightly, would be quite understandably quite confused. Well, as a humanitarian it. crisis, it certainly right. would Right. To the extent concerned. this is an issue that people focus on, sure. Uh, but there are a lot of humanitarian crises in the world um, in, in which we don't intervene uh, with, with military force. So I, I think, by and large, against the backdrop of uh, an economic recession and a fledgling recovery, extrication of American forces uh, complete from Iraq, soon to be complete, at least the bulk of them from Afghanistan, that there's really no stomach, no will, and no sense that an American military role would produce an end state quickly or easily that um, we, we, we would prefer. So of all those who have called for military action, you haven't heard a military scenario or plan that sounds viable. No, I've, I've heard no compelling strategy, and that's the key, because this is a discretionary conflict, and in discretionary conflicts, you have to have a strategy that makes sense, and you have to gauge the relationship between the application of military force and the end game. I mean, military force is an instrument to achieve a desired outcome. Mm -hmm. And if, in fact, you can't coordinate or correlate the two, what, what's the point? It, it becomes a, an open-ended commitment that could be quite dangerous and harmful. And when risks are involved, you need either a compelling moral reason or a compelling strategic reason to not to be too glib about it, pull the trigger. Right, and those who are pushing the president forward believe there is a moral, humanitarian, and strategic rationale for some kind of American military involvement. And I, I think it's a, it's a fairly compelling case. Against that, however, is the reality of the end state and the uncertainties over the end state. Neither supporting the opposition with the kind of military equipment they want, which is anti-armor and anti-air, a no-fly zone, 
or direct application of American military power against leadership targets or Syrian military assets seems to hold out the, 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 the promise of not only getting rid of the Assad's, you could probably do that if the president committed himself to a military strategy to degrade the regime's ca uh, capacities and capabilities. But then what? Uh, and personally, I've been among those who have cautioned great restraint. I don't want America getting stuck with the check on this. Yeah, the, uh, the whole notion of bright red lines or lines in the sand or however, what metaphor you choose. Uh, bad idea, good idea? Well, you know, red lines are supposed to be conflict avoiders, not conflict enhancers. And I suspect when they're um, applied carefully, deliberately, and with credibility, that is to say, the drawing of the so-called red line really is a red line. It doesn't turn pink. Mm -hmm. That, in fact, it can be um, ver very effective. But in our case, um, both with respect to Syria and Iran, I'm not sure that the impact of these red lines, which in fact have turned pink, certainly on the Syrian case, um, you, you could have argued that the president was not wise to say what he did. We, we focused on the risks of acting. What about the consequences of not acting? What about those arguments that this sends a bad message to North Korea or, or Iran or anyone else who might act out? All kinds of, ne of, of, of negative, uh, compelling negative downsides for, for not acting. There's no question about it. But this notion of American credibility, which seems to be at the centerpiece, is in many respects a fleeting reality. Sure, you could probably enhance American credi credibility today. Then the question is, you've initiated a series of steps which lead you into a future of, of great uncertainty. Is Syria a vital national interest of the United States of America? That is the core question. If it is, the president ought to have created a strategy to do something about it. If it isn't, and governing is about choosing, particularly for a second term president, he ought to remain pretty risk averse. Is there a yes or no answer? Is there any scenario for a quick resolution or any quick uh, development that changes the scenario? No, no game changers. Sorry to hear that. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. That's all for this edition of Dialogue at the Wilson Center. Until next week, I'm John Molesky. Thanks you for joining us as well. Thanks again, Aaron. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Television and Radio. Our host's Twitter feed is twitter.com backslash John Molesky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhznetworks.org.